all owe them, but very few of us know them. They took an oath to protect us at home and abroad, so the rest of us can live safe and free. They are the men and women of our military and first responder communities, and these are their stories. American Warrior Radio is on the air. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. You're tuned to American Warrior Radio. This is your host, Ben Bueller Garcia. A very special welcome to listeners in Colorado Springs on our newest affiliate, KRDO News Radio. We're debuting on KRDO this weekend. Thanks to our presenting sponsors in the Springs, Colonel Rich Lewis and Pam Barron of Medicare Mentors. The Medicare maze can be a challenge for everyone, but especially so for veterans and their spouses who have to weigh how Medicare works with their VA health care or TRICARE for life. No matter where you are, Medicare Mentors can be your advocate and resource. If you have questions about your benefits or just need a health care checkup, they can be reached at 719-339-1835 or visit MedicareMentorsLLC.com. Here at American Warrior Radio, we tell the stories of those who serve in our military and the first responders who protect us on the home front. We also like to check in with veterans who have made the transition and found success in the civilian world. Our guest today hits all three of those points. He served as a Green Beret medic, he was a firefighter, and is now making his way in Hollywood. You may have already seen him on the big screen in films like Vice or on your television in the series SEAL Team or Ray Donovan. Jeff Bosley is also the perfect guest for our Colorado Springs debut because he's a Colorado native and spent some time at Fort Carson during his service in the U.S. Army. Jeff, welcome to American Warrior Radio. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for having me. It's a huge, huge honor. Oh, get out of here. (laughs) No, it it is. It's an amazing show, and you threw it into Colorado Springs. I can't, uh, that's, that's two for two right there. Well, you know, you'd been bugging us to come on to the show, Jeff, for what, like six years now, and I kept telling you, at, wait, at least, wait, wait, till we get yeah. Colorado Springs. I, I'm, pre- I'm pretty relentless on that social media. You know, I just kept bothering you, kept bothering you. <laughs> well, I, that's a joke, folks. We reached out to Jeff because we really <laughs> wanted him on the show. Uh, now, Jeff, you've had, uh, I don't know what phrase is appropriate, maybe a, a twisted and tortured resume. Um, but let's. <laughs> that's probably the more politically correct answer. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Uh, But much of what you've done seems to have a a tie back to, you know, maybe some inspiration from your father, who was an emergency room physician there in Colorado. Um, Is that, I think, as I understand, Jeff, that's why when you decided to go to college, you started off studying pre-med? Yeah, I mean, it was one of those things I was very fortunate. My father uh, just recently retired as an emergency room physician, and um, I was fortunate in, even though his generation typically was the generation to kind of heavily imply, um, you know, hey, son, you better do what I do. He wasn't really like that, which is good, but just because I was around it, that just kind of permeated my existence. He's a physician. Two out of his three other brothers are surgeons or physicians of some type. Uh, so I just was around it. And as a patient, I spent a lot of time in the emergency room. So it just kind of got to me. And so that was definitely something that, that influenced a lot of my decisions. So it just seemed like, well, I like medicine. Let's go to college and go to pre-med. That just kind of made sense. Now, when did you pick up the acting bug? I've I've heard you mention, Jeff, that, you know, as a kid growing up, like a lot of us, you watched a lot of films and you yeah. wanted to be Rambo. Um, yeah. Was that did that acting become of interest to you prior to college, or that something um, you just? Yeah, no, it absolutely was there. Um, I think my parents, much to their uh, their humor at this point in my life, look back and aren't surprised now retrospectively. But I definitely, you know, just like any of us kids, we played. You know, I played with GI Joes, and I was I always I, I I took as a kid I was I took pretend to whole new levels. You know, I. I I was very, I was very much an emergency room physician's son in that I needed details. I loved details and elaborating on a universe. And, you know, I didn't just like pretend I was Maverick and Top Gun. I, I took a, you know, refrigerator box and I actually added wings to it and I created working flaps and a joystick and windshield wipers, which doesn't make any sense. But, uh, (laughs) so it was very much in my blood. But I never really got into it. I did, you know, school plays in grade school, which we kind of all, I think, to be honest with you, I think you have to. <laughs> to be, mm-hmm. I don't think you ever get a, I don't think you have a choice. And then I dabbled in it in high school, and then uh, and I, I just kind of like I said, I was raised around practicality, so it just anything impractical just seemed to not be something I should do. 
I just it was just like an implied passive feeling. Um, and then, um, but in college, that's when I said, you know, I need some electives. I'm going to a liberal arts college in Washington at the time. And so I took a couple acting classes and absolutely fell in love with it. And then when I transferred to a college in Idaho, in Idaho, I went, I went straight up double major as a sports medicine and theater major and, um, definitely went to town on the theater major. I, I went all in for that. Jeff, what what inspired you to go ahead and, and become a real life Rambo? I mean, what did, yeah. did, did September 11th was that kicking around in the back Absolutely. of your brain, or yeah, unquestionably. Um, you know, like I, I was raised around movies and and watching all that stuff, and so I def there's definitely a weird dichotomy of how I was influenced, you know, through just entertainment and media, and it's odd, so it kind of is no surprise what I've how I've done what I've done. But because I was so deep in the theater major and all that, and I was getting older, I was in my late twenties, getting to be early, you know, almost thirty when nine eleven happened, and you just, I, I got used to life and comfort and not, you know, I didn't want to be told what to do and all that. But then nine eleven did happen, and I still let it beat around me and just not my my subconscious for a couple years even, and then finally, almost a couple years, almost three, four years, and then finally. uh I said, I have to do this before I get too old because uh, I know I will regret it for the rest of my life. And finally, I went right to the recruiter's office and uh, then proposed to my, uh, at the time, girlfriend the next day. <laughs> good timing, brother. I went, yeah, well, I, 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 I was, it's kind of good timing, but I was in basic training while the wedding planning was happening. So, I mean, call that a, <laughs> an accidental design. I, I, Jeff, I tell you what, just being a relatively recent newlywed myself, I'd say you timed that even, even better. Thank you. Um, now, you you always – Special Forces was, was on your radar. You you clearly decided yeah. that's the route you want to go, but the Marines are out to lunch, I guess, literally. That was true. Um, Absolutely true. I went to the recruiter station. They all share like a little strip mall thing. Uh, my brother was – at the time, he was still serving as a Marine, and I said – and I knew a couple of random people in my family had been Marines, so I just went to them because they just – you know, I like big, tough – you know, they're big, tough animals – and the door was literally locked. And so I said, I went next door. Um, and while I was waiting, I, I came to the realization that in the Marines, you can't, ha you don't have a lot of say in your initial job. And uh, I didn't like that. So while I was waiting in the uh, Army waiting room, I, I said, okay, I'm glad this actually worked out. And then, yeah, I always knew I wanted to do something, whether it was Marine Force Recon, the SEAL route, or the Green Beret route. That was no no other question. I didn't want to do anything else in the military. Uh, Jeff, no disrespect, but at, at 28 years old, walking into a recruiter's uh, office, you're you're kind of an old dude. I mean, yeah. Um, t and Green Beret is not easy. Green Beret no. medic is doubly not easy. Uh, t Correct. Tell us about the X-ray program. Uh, I, yeah, I wasn't familiar with that. It's yeah. It's it's come and gone. It's, it has its it has its in, inception. I think back in Vietnam, where they just needed to fill the ranks because that's kind of where Green Berets unofficially officially kind of came into existence. And it's it's for lack of better terms, it's off the street. And that doesn't mean your training changes. It just means you don't typically have a career in the military before you try out. And over the years, that program has changed. It, it, it used to not exist. It, it came back into existence when they needed to fill the ranks. Uh, some people love it. Some people hate it. I knew at my age, because you're right, going in older sucked. Um, I knew at my age, I, I wanted to streamline it. And my conscience was clear that I wasn't doing it because I was lazy or trying to cut corners. I knew whatever I had lost experience wise not joining the infantry at 18 i knew i would be able to catch up so to speak um and so it's, it's basically you go straight into tryout to special forces um that's the abbreviated version but that's essentially it there's no there's no you still go to infantry basic training um and then you head off to airborne school and then you go straight to special forces pre-training and tryouts and god willing you make it and then you just keep on going through what we call the pipeline um, so that's the x-ray program and um, it's it, it's you know there's two sides of the argument for me I still think somebody needs to be older to go into special forces and or have substantial military experience because it's just something you can't make up mm -hmm. I, I believe there is a current age limit on the x-ray program I don't think you can be 18 and do it I don't think I think that's you don't want an 18 year old green beret that that'll take to the grave um but yeah, it was definitely harder. I mean, my base, my drill sergeant basic training was 
I would venture to say at least three years my junior. Uh, my recruiter I know was younger than me. Um, so it was always uh, – but at the same time, because I, I got the game, so to speak. My best friend has been in the military his whole life. You know, he's a big infantry guy. You know, so I kind of got a little mental preparation. So I knew they were messing with me. So it was kind of nice because I didn't let it bother me as much. Sure. Uh, but, yeah, my body was – you know, it already kind of got its damage from, a, you know, spending a life in my dad's emergency room. <laughs> so okay. It, it was a little bit harder on the body for sure. I definitely did have to compensate with my mind. But Jeff, when we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about your Green Beret. I'm not going to use the word career because unfortunately, um, well, maybe fortunately for folks that like movies, but unfortunately for the United States Army, it was a relatively short career. Folks, is your host, Ben Bueller Garcia. We're joined by Jeff Bosley. Jeff was, uh, well, he's been a warrior. He's been a sheepdog, and now he's an actor. Stick around. You're going to want to hear the rest of the show. Welcome back to American Warrior Radio, ladies and gentlemen. This is your host, Ben Bueller-Garcia. We're joined by Jeff Bosley. Jeff hits it on all cylinders when it comes to American Warrior Radio. He's a former Green Beret medic. He's been a firefighter, and he's now making his way in probably maybe the roughest business. Well, I shouldn't say that. Being a Green Beret is pretty rough, too, but the roughest business there is trying to make it in Hollywood. Jeff, welcome back. Now, you... I, your time in the Green Berets was relatively short. I want to say maybe six or seven years. Yeah, correct. Yeah, it wasn't. It, I didn't do the twenty years. Um, I had got to a point where I could get to my reenlistment. I think I was at six or seven. Like I just, I got out just around like a, a December January switch. So, um, yeah, it was short by you know the twenty year comparison for sure. And that that was not intentional. You just you got injured and it was. A, just yeah. time to find a new line of work. Yeah, it was. I mean, I, I kind of had a, the big, you know, come to a, whatever believers <laughs> decision, thinking about it. And I really sat down and had to believe and think about how the wars were going. I'm by no means a warmonger. Mm-hmm. But I liked doing my job um, uh, because, you know, even though I was a medic, our job was a little, you know, well, like our motto says is we're, we help free the oppressed. And sometimes that that's not all about hugs and, and courtesies and uh, things were getting just weird enough. I had, I had started going through the South end of a divorce and I just kind of, and my body was falling apart. And I was like, these things just added up to me going, all right, you know, it, I did what I needed to do and let's just not re-enlist this time around. Now you, you spent some time as a, a volunteer firefighter, as I understand it, while you were in mm-hmm. college. So your next step on, on that twisted path, career path, was to go <laughs> back to Colorado Springs and, and become a full-time firefighter. Uh, not not a bad decision based on the fact, and, and for our, you know, our new listeners in Colorado Springs, they'll, they'll remember yeah. this. There was a, a certain little incident <laughs> on May 5th, 2014, at a little yep. place called the Mark, Martin Drake Power Plant, a three-alarm yep. fire there. Well, how long had you been on the uh, uh, the uh, fire department when that kicked off? Yeah, um, I had probably been in over just over a year, year and change at that point. Um, I had just finished my probation period, and I was now what's li- by, through licensure called a firefighter too. So then I was just I was pretty much serving at that point. You know, I was just at, working as a firefighter. So yeah. It was, it was, yeah, because when I was in college, I did it as a volunteer. And actually, ironically, I actually went to the fire academy while out processing the military. So that last, there was a handful of months where it was like Ferris Bueller's Day Off. It was a lot of shenanigans mm-hmm. um, to, pull, to pull off both. But um, yeah, I was at, a, at the time of that fire, I was at Firehouse One downtown. And uh, anybody listening, <laughs> I was in the calendar and I, I got a wrath of, crud for that my entire career so uh to anybody at csfd hello <laughs> <laughs> well all of a sudden i think the uh the phone lines in colorado springs are lighting up looking for that counter and that this was and i mentioned that fire specifically because this this plant yeah. jeff provided about 30 percent of the power to the the city of colorado springs and your truck company and i tell you i i paid for college fighting forest fires and and that's you, no joke 
Well, <laughs> send send me into ten thousand acres of blaze, not a problem. Send me into a burning building. You guys have got to be completely nuts. So yeah, and and especially so that if anybody knows anything about law enforcement, first responders, the Medal of Valor is is a big deal, uh, particularly for firefighters. And your your truck company was awarded the Medal of Valor for that your actions that day with on the power plant. Yeah, I think um, it was really happenstance, as I feel. I mean, yeah, because that plant, I mean, it, it sounds, uh, there is a movie, ironically, going back to movies, there's a movie that's called, I think, Ladder 49, where it just, it's it's that giant of a property where it, there's just a lot of danger, and a lot of people don't understand with firefighting. It's sometimes, like, you'll, especially on the news, you'll you'll see people, the firefighters just kind of standing around, with it, you know, it looks like they're not saving it where in reality there's sometimes where fire just can't be saved and they just got to keep it from spreading. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is such a giant property. And since it is that power plant, there's actually stuff aerosolized in the air that was basically just aerosolized fuel. And so, I mean, we were actually opening the garage door um, and, and as the door opened, you could see the, the, the plume of smoke. I mean, it was right in our eye line because we were so close. So we got there the fastest just because of, you know, proximity. And we were the first ones in. And and the huge, the the inception of wherever the Medal of Valor decision was made unquestionably goes to the captain and the seniors on that t- crew because they're the ones that, ass- they, they were the first ones literally on the scene to assess, is this, a, are we going to save the property? Are we looking for lives? Are we looking for lives nearby? And they had to, you know, there's a handful of assessments that that officer on duty has to make. And a part of part of that assessment was going in and checking it out. And uh, I won't lie. Yeah, like running into a burning building, as cliche as it is, it is obviously against your instincts. But for some reason, I'm not like a daredevil. There was still something there's something. So it's obviously a huge chemical dump of a dump of adrenaline. But it, there is something about that, even now just retelling the story that I just long for, which is messed up in, in EMS and first responder world because for you to do your job and enjoy it, some t- nine times out of ten, that means something's going wrong for somebody else. So it's an unfortunate job to have. Right. Um, but it was, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, that, that officer ran the show and we went in and uh, I'm the big giant guy and also the newer guy on the crew. So we were there just hustling in the the weight of those hoses loaded with water uh while you're breathing while your adrenaline's going you're breathing in oxygen you're wearing all that heavy uh turnout gear it's uh, there i to, to date there's no workout that reminds me of that moment i was at the bottom of the stairs feeding that hose where i was i've never felt my lungs even counting my green beret career where i where i thought my lungs were gonna not make it through the day Wow. Well, yeah, I tell you, we we host uh, a part of a group that does a, a memorial 9-11 tower challenge, and we have folks climb the 2,071 steps to replicate the Twin Towers, Jeff. Yeah. And I see, we you know, we have firefighters that do it in their full turnout gear, except yeah. for the boost, just because of the nature of the stairs. That's a little dangerous. But uh, yeah. I tell you what, I got nothing but respect for for folks that run toward danger so that the rest of us yeah. can, can bug out. And, and thank you. Thank you for doing that. Oh, I, I was in the right place in the wrong time, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you, you kind of remind me of my brother. He he was an uh, ambulance driver, went into firefighting, and then went into uh, Air Force Special Forces. So, yeah, there's there's clearly a, a trend line there for, for you guys that, uh, you know, adrenaline junkie is not the right word. But um, t- tell me a little bit, because I've heard some, read some quotes from you, Jeff, about the the difference between you know coming back to the the warrior ethos if you will mm-hmm. the difference between somebody who can when you need to when you need to exert extreme violence you can flip that switch on and off yeah. versus the the folks i mean your your sociopath out there the guys that are just bullies yeah, yeah. Uh, and and i think that's yeah i've i've probably stated it much more eloquently in my past but i think the i is, i I attribute that awareness of what I call, you know, flipping the switch, so to speak, to my mental maturity at which age, at the age I entered the service. Um, I, I have a very interesting psychological perspective as far as like, wow, what would I have been like at 18 when I was very, I mean, physiologically, your frontal lobe hasn't uh, matured enough to the point where you can't help but be indoctrinated. 
So I'm genuinely curious how my mind would have acted if I enlisted, you know, at 18 versus late 20s. And I think that's where that, that light switch kind of comes into play is, you know, like I I think 99% of the time, uh, anybody that meets me, I'm relatively jovial. I have my bad days, you know, I'll probably swear to my with my friends of having a bad morning or whatever like that. But 99% of the time, I'm kind of a jolly green giant. But, I mean, there were times on deployments where I was like, I, you know, I mean, let's be honest. I'm very glad my mother didn't have to see me certain times because I was right in what I'm doing. But it was a side, that switch, if you will, that I wouldn't want my own mother to see, nor my at the time wife. Because it's just, it's the unfortunate side of war, combat, terrorism, whatever it is. And and I think people that, that where that light switch becomes a dimmer that's where we get issues psychologically where, you know, like a 20 year vet, I know some tons of 20 year green berets that I respect massively, but if you're indoctrinated or if you're saturated in that existence so long, that light switch, you've been turning it on and off so many times. It's, it, 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 it wears metaphorically. It's not as crisp as a flip. So it become, it accidentally becomes a dimmer in a way. And I think, I, I think I have a huge theory on, military you know we're deployed and we come back so we're kind of off it's not like while i'm driving around fort carson i have to start i have to walk around looking for terrorists you know mm-hmm. I'm, I'm home and i can relax a little bit but then if you look at like fire or police you know they have a 24-hour shift and they're back on the streets i i, I genuinely think they i don't want to say have it harder but they're on and off much more frequently and as a result their net being on throughout their life is much more intense and so i can't fathom that life of doing that for 15 20 years especially like a high crime city that on off switch you know it's it's it it barely exists i imagine well yeah and that's where it becomes bullies and that's where it becomes they're psychologically not adapted to handle it anymore and then they can become bad cops or bullies or what have you you know unfortunately well, and, and you that's a very good point, Jeff, because and that switch is being flipped on and off several times a day, and yeah. you, you just don't know when. I mean, when you're a Green Beret and, and Jeff Bosley's in Iraq, you know. You, you know, you know yeah. you're in a, a, a challenging place and bad things yeah. might happen, but, I mean, with a police officer, you don't know how, you know, yeah. just a, a traffic stop could turn into a shootout. Um, Life and death, yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah, and I, and I, I, every police officer I've met, somebody – kind of brought me to that awareness years ago and it really hit me hard where i realized i'm not justifying the bad law enforcement officers out there every 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 profession has you know some bad bad apples um but i'm not justifying it but i'm like wow i can see if a fragile mind is around that and set it's this bad recipe for you know non-success and it's you know if you're here in east la and that's where you're at every day your shift and, uh, yeah. you know, yeah, it's it's unfathomable to me. Yeah. Jeff, we're going to have to take another break yep. here. Before we do, I'm going to leave you with a quote. When we come back, there's going to be a quiz, brother. When we come back, I want you to tell me who it is. And the quote is, so many of us choose our path out of fear disguised as practicality. What we really want seems impossibly out of reach, so we never dare to ask the universe for it. I am the proof that you can ask the universe for it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your host, Ben Bueller-Garcia. We're joined by Jeff Bosley. When we come back, we're going to talk about his next switch and his tortured career path, becoming an actor. Stick around. Welcome back to American Warrior Radio, ladies and gentlemen. This is your host, Ben Bueller-Garcia. We're joined on the phone by Jeff Bosley. Jeff is a a very intriguing cat. I tell you what, he's one of those people where if you see his picture, he looks awfully scary. But we're learning through our chat with him here on American Warrior Radio. He's really a gentle giant. Jeff, before the break, I left you with a quiz, a little quote. The guy who said that, who uh, is credited with that quote, wrote himself a check for $10 million dollars. And on the memo oh. line he wrote for acting services rendered, he gave yep. himself five years to cash it in. Who are we talking about? Mr. Jim Carrey. Has that quote, <laughs> and, and by the way, if folks don't know the story, a few weeks before. I didn't bef- Google that. No, <laughs> you didn't Googleize it. Okay. 
a few weeks before the deadline, he learned he actually would be making ten million dollars for the film Dumb yeah. and Dumber. So, uh, <laughs> Jeff, you and I know for an Army Green Beret medic, it's hard to imagine something that would be rough going. But yeah. In your case, I mean, we've seen literally. My wife and I were watching the movie Vice uh, three nights ago, and I saw it's like that's that's Jeff. I can tell it's Jeff because I mean, dude, you're six foot five. Yeah, but, I don't I don't blend. <laughs> what it, did Carrie's quote? Do you do you look back on that for for inspiration? Because you're you're pursuing the Hollywood track a little bit different than I understand most aspiring actors do. Yeah. I mean, unquestionably, it speaks to me. I mean, and here's how I don't even think I've ever really confessed this. And it's by no means a secret, but it it, it affects me daily in that it's actually uh, his initials. Not because I love Jim Carrey so much. I mean, he's a great guy. But it's that quote spoke to me that shortly after that quote, uh, a friend of mine and various circumstances in less than three days happened where I said, OK, I'm moving to L.A. I'm doing it. And seeing that commencement speech that day that he gave that quote of, you know, I'm shortening it, but not leaving a life of fear disguised as practicality. I called it good uh, and, and moved to L.A. And um, his, his initials are tattooed on, on my arm under I have a tattoo that says why. And then various initials of people that have influenced me of, as to why I am where I am or why I continue to do what I do. And his, his initials are there because of that quote. And uh, had I heard it before the Green Break, it would have absolutely been applicable um, but the reason it applied me to me more, you know, especially the schooling of the Green Bay Medical School, it makes my college pre-med look like a joke. You know, I went to at anatomy and physiology like three days a week for 50 minutes. You know, we did that for eight hours a day, five days a week sometimes. And I just it was it was unbelievable what I did. I don't know if I could do it again, but it applies more to this Hollywood shenanigans in that. Green Beret world, when it comes down to the logistics, you know, everybody gets a paycheck. Uh, firefighter world, same thing. What that, Those were still, quote, unquote, practical jobs. They came with the reassurance of health benefits for my family. They came with benefits of a salary. They came with some nice warm and fuzzies that help you kind of do your job without stressing about a lot of other stuff, unless you're just really poor with money and poor with your life choices. The whole Hollywood thing, as anybody assumes and knows or doesn't know, there's, you could, I've said it before, you can put 100% in, and that doesn't equal direct and proportionate results out. I can put 100% in and get zero, and that's that. So that's the opposite of practical. This whole world is not practical. Jeff, let's talk a little more about that, because I recently met an actor who was in a major, I mean major series, yeah. and he's working at Home Depot in the interim to, to pay the bills. You And what I meant by you're doing this different in yeah. that you're yeah. not – we're not going to see Jeff Bosley waiting tables somewhere uh, or, or at Home Depot. Not that there's anything yeah. wrong with, with Correct, those yeah. careers, but you, like a Green Beret, you're in, you're in 110%. Yeah, and that's, I think that's, yes. Um, what I took away from the Green Beret and firefighter things is my, I call it my spectrum of suck, has greatly widened. So what I consider miserable and horrible and, and you know, not ideal is way more diluted than it used to be when I was 18. If I was 18 living the life I am now in LA, I'd probably be crying nightly with, you know, sucking on my thumb. Now I take that green beret mentality and I apply it to LA. And like you said, there's nothing wrong with, I would say 99.9% .9 of my friends, either are teachers, bartenders, personal trainers, what, or a combination of all the above. And I vowed to come to LA and only do one thing. And that was to act or pursue acting. I've had miscellaneous side jobs, don't get me wrong, just to grab some paychecks here and there, but I have, I'm pretty sure I'm not exaggerating. I'm very, very sure I've not had a formal, you know, I-9, W-2 paycheck job, i.e. Uh, Home Depot, et cetera, since I moved to L.A. I've had just piecemeal jobs, and that was because I, I was all in. And it also created a lack of uh, options, as cliche as it is, right. but, you know, failure is not an option, yeah. but it gave me no backups. It gave me no safety net. So I had to find ways to make it happen in a world where there is no guarantees. There is no practicality. And so don't get me wrong. It's, it's, I'm not a walking ball of sunshine and, and stress-free existence as a result. But um, I think I was speaking to some, you offline, maybe as a result, I track my, my auditions and I've had more auditions and opportunities 
by 100 to 200 fold than some of my brethren that have been here two to three times longer than me. And that's because I'm, I live, eat, breathe this and yeah. I'll wait for it. I'm available for it. And I don't have to call into a job or quit a job or create a bad reputation because I'm that guy that always calls in sick for auditions. Well, what so your, it, your strategy, Jeff, reminds me of a, another military figure in history who basically burned his ships when he arrived in the New World. And that, uh, <laughs> exactly. that, that provides a little extra motivation. So you, you yep. burned your ships when you burned arrived in, in Hollywood. Uh, Jeff, one of the things that we hear so often, particularly you know, any military member, but particularly Special Forces folks is what they miss when they go when they leave when they go out in the civilian world is is the camaraderie and you're working as part of a team towards a common goal in hollywood though i'm guessing even though you've got buddies and other actors and they may even be other veterans it's i mean is that camaraderie gone because it's i mean you're you're fighting for the same gig yeah, and that's the it's a huge catch twenty two because I it's obviously how you handle it personally. I personally am extremely competitive and it might not be healthy long term, but you know, if I go to audition the hallway is full of clones of me. And to me it's just whether you growing up playing sports, that competition is my competition. It doesn't mean I want them to get hit by a bus or I wish them ill will, but I want to beat them. I want to win. So Ironically, a lot of my friends won't probably audition for the same roles as me. That's just a coincidental accident. Um, but and also, yeah, you're right. That that camaraderie isn't there. Um, it, it's not the same. Like there's a couple of veteran things I do around the city, um, and and it's but it's still within a city that's not a it's not doesn't have an air of veteran existence like you would at a Fort Carson within Colorado Springs, etc. And uh, yeah, it's 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 there, but it, it's I, I can dabble into it. Like once a week, there's a veteran thing that uh, another Green Beret actually invited me to, and uh, you know, it's like an it's a sport event, you know, or a workout thing that we do weekly for an hour, and it's it's got a veteran camaraderie, but it's once a week, you know. But there's nothing like as a firefighter being on shift with your brothers and sisters for 24 hours, and potentially like that one call, you know, your lives are in each other's hands. There's nothing mm-hmm. like being on an ODA, the Green Bray, you know, team um, in in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever for, you know, months and months at a time in firefights or whatever, there's, there, that is, there's nothing comparable to that here uh, when you're out of the service in general. But then absolutely without getting to like any remotely political, Los Angeles and Hollywood are on near the other polar end of the spectrum compared to serving as a Green Bray. I mean, that's anybody can say that pretty objectively. So sure, sure. So it now, sure. educate me here, Jeff, because I don't, <laughs> I, I can't, I, I can't imagine there's that many, you know, six foot five, two hundred and fifty pound, <laughs> no. you know, cut like granite guys out there auditioning for parts who have the added benefit of being able to do their own stunts, and yeah. and no trigger discipline and know what looks yeah. real because you've been real. It's, are are those guys just kicking around Hollywood on the corner? No, and that's what you're what you're saying is an exact safe assumption. There is, and I, I say very all this very hesitantly without sounding very uh, self centered, but I'm pretty sure I'm one of a few because I mean, when it comes to Hollywood, when I try to really distinguish so people know. I look at the, the job. I love the job. Don't get me wrong. I love the art of it. I love performing. But at the end of the day, it's still a job like a race car driver talking about his race car. It doesn't mean he's self-centered talking about his how his car performs. So I really try to discriminate how I talk about myself as an actor. And I don't want people to think, you know, I know I'm tall. I know I'm six and a half feet tall and I have blue eyes. That's like saying I know I have a fast car. I'm not patting myself on the back. I know logistically in the aesthetic of this business, I'm, I'm pretty rare. But the, the catch with that is, is there's, that also means there's very rare roles for that thing. So when the role exists, I'm almost a shoe in But rarely does the role exist until you're leading man guy. And this is perfect. You brought up Vice. I actually had a much – I had lines and a much bigger role. And that day on the set, I was way too tall um, when we were getting ready to shoot because it looks kind of – cruddy to have me with and mr Chris, i was shooting scenes with christian bale and he's an average size dude i think he's maybe six one mm-hmm. so he's by no means a short guy but the framing of that shot looks cruddy 
to get me in the same frame as him. There's a huge blank space above his head to get me in the shot. So they recast me on the spot. I, the same thing happened for me two, three weeks ago in Westworld. I was too tall. I was supposed to have a scene with like Sir Anthony Hopkins, and they recast me on the spot. So they're like, oh, wow, he's too tall. So pretty much I have to jump from struggling, crawling my way up to getting the leading man role. So then everybody else has to work around me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Because it, so it's catch too. It's so unique and single that it's also bad. In so, a way. I mean, do you have a contract, Jeff, or do you get paid the same when they sort of demote you right there on the set? Or does uh, that yeah, mean yeah. less like, money? It, it, essentially, yeah, because they're all union jobs. I, I'm in the, the SAG after union. And uh, yeah, so like you're there and it's like a flat rate. You're paid for an eight hour day. Um, and it's, you know, just like in the military, ironically, there's a whole lot of hurry up and wait. So you'll, you'll end up being there. Even when I got quote unquote demoted that night, I was there for the whole day. I still got fully paid and I just got to sit there and I, I always bring work with me in my backpack. So I popped open my laptop and, you know, did some work and emails and whatnot. And I got paid the full day rate, you know, so they, you know, as far as like the paycheck, you still get paid. That's never those demotions, so to speak. Um, don't hurt you so much as you know putting food on your table but yeah it's, it's kind of stinks to try out for the team and make make the cuts and then on the day of the big game they pull you out sure <laughs> sure so. folks this is your host ben bueller garcia we're talking with jeff bosley jeff is a former green beret medic he's been a firefighter he was actually he and his uh truck company awarded the medal of valor for an action in colorado springs now he's in hollywood when we come back we're going to pick jeff's brain a little bit more about what that's like and do some strong likes and dislikes when we come back. Stick around. Welcome back to American Warrior Radio, ladies and gentlemen. This is your host, Ben Bueller Garcia. We're joined by Jeff Bosley. You can learn more. Visit Jeff Bosley, B O S L E Y dot com. Also, check out Patreon.com, P A T R E O N dot com forward slash Jeff Bosley. Uh, the Land of Boz podcast can be found there. Some, some good stuff. Jeff, one of uh, the guests that we've had a couple of times on American Warrior Radio, just a terrific guy. Uh, definitely a warrior himself, won several, I think, three Purple Hearts in Vietnam as a Marine, uh, Dale Dye. And oh, yeah. he, you know, also, con- uh, not, not kind of, he's, he's definitely a Hollywood legend. He's been, you know, Band of Brothers, Saving Private Ryan. He's all over the place. But one of the things that Dale shared with us what I found interesting was not a fear of being typecast because at the end of the day, a guy's got to work, right? A man or woman's yeah, got to work. Yeah. You got to earn that paycheck. Yeah. But he says, I want to do comedy. W- one of his favorite scenes was, <laughs> and I don't think it ever made it to the big screen where he was having a, a, a banana fight with a monkey in a cockpit or something just crazy <laughs> like this. And that, he, it was wonderful, but it's Dale yeah. die. It's Colonel sink. It's, you know, do, yeah. do you worry about that or it doesn't matter? You need to get paid. Um, I'm a little of both because I'm aware I, I kind of – I do pat myself on the back a little bit for being highly aware that this is an art. You know, the whole acting thing and performing, it is an art. You, you know, you evoke emotions, and I, like we had spoke before, you you, uh, you provide people some escape from whatever reality they want escape from for 90 minutes. So there's that side. But at the same time, I still do know for a fact it's a business. Um, you know, so people that are making million dollar residual checks, they can make whatever decision they want that satisfies them and not have to worry about that paycheck to put food on their table. So there is that how to navigate world of, you know, I got to work, but you know, if I keep playing, here's a great example. If I keep playing bodyguard number three, mm-hmm. I will play bodyguard number three for the rest of my career. Um, if, if you do it like, you know, so much. And so there is that risk because, you do have to kind of have that come to Jesus of what do I want out of my career, but you also want to work. I know until I can kind of become more of a draw where they'll, they'll cater to my uh, offerings more. I do know what I am. Like you said, I'm a six and a half foot tall dude with muscles and tattoos and blue eyes. Odds are I'm not going to play a frail heroin addicted professor at a college. And, you know, so why would I even audition for that? But I do know within my narrower lane, 
I can still, you know, I can still go from the, you know, shore to shore a little bit and bounce back and forth and hopefully get a lot of work. Um, but like you said, Dale, the comedy is a perfect example. On paper, if you, since you and I know who Dale is, but so I'm, that's, I'm an unknown. You look on paper on at Jeff, I have tons of acting training, tons of acting experience. And then you scroll down my resume a little bit more and you're like, oh, this, it almost sounds like I'm lying. Oftentimes people think I'm making it up and I, I, I keep documents with me to prove that I'm not. They're like, okay, and he was a Green Beret. Okay, and he was a firefighter. Okay, and, and he was, and I'm like, yeah, I promise on these things. And then they're like, okay, but he can't possibly be funny. And <laughs> I actually, I am. I've done like stand up or not stand up, um, improv things. I, I did a play at a theater here recently where, I bring it up Jim Carrey and it was very much a Jim Carrey esque character and everyone that saw it said we wouldn't have thought you could do that just looking at you, which is cool. It's a nice little pat on the back. But if I only went for Jim Carrey roles, I would never even get an audition because they would just on paper they'd look and go, That guy probably isn't funny because Jeff- it is an industry. Let's, yeah. let's you did you have taken a, a page out of a Dale Dye's book though, and I don't know, I mean clearly you're still trying to get to that that next level but yeah. was it pretty cool when someone sent you a photo of you 60 foot tall on a billboard in in new york city <laughs> yeah yeah that was an unexpected surprise i didn't even know it was happening um i mean i got to play basically i was playing a special forces guy in the call of duty game and uh, next thing you know i was at, on a uh, times square with all my fu manchu creepy mustache glory and uh uh, <laughs> and, and you're, I, didn't, you know, I mean, I, I didn't know what was happening. Yeah, like, your so your special skill is is what attack dogs plus three or <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I have some crazy pit bull attack dog character. That, uh, <laughs> when we did the when we did all the shooting and all that, I just there was a guy off camera tugging on a leash, you know. So that was all I, I added digitally <laughs> later. And and yeah, it was just absurd. And actually, a, a green beret, another green beret that's actually hotel year, if you will. He, you know, he's like, "Hey, I got some miles. Go to go. Let me fly to New York and get in some pictures in front of that sucker." Well, and so, well, yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just a radio host, Jeff. I don't know anything, but um, <laughs> you know, there might. Let me just throw this idea out there and and see what you think and see what the uh, the Twitterverse thinks about this. What about you as? Mm, Jack Reacher, for example, would that work? I, mean, I would dabble with that theory. I mean, it's it's been thrown around a little bit, <laughs> uh, but yes, as as you're jokingly hinting at, um, that is a classic example of of the two movies that people everybody knew about. Uh, Tom Cruise did them, and if you didn't know they were books, you were just thought they were gener- generically just two Tom Cruise movies. But if you knew they were based on now twenty five twenty two plus books you know the character no disrespect to mr cruz i respect him and his career and i'd actually like to emulate a chunk of it uh the character in the book is let's just keep it simple me the guy's mm-hmm. six foot six he's 250 plus pounds he's blue eyes just a, a truck of a human and and the author's always written that as a plot point it's not like a happenstance mentioning like oh he drove a white sedan and then it's never mentioned again his size is a constant plot point so the fans and I was a book fan in the army. I read the book for the first time, actually using a uh, outdoor toilet in Iraq. I found one on the ground, and that's no that exaggeration. Might be too much information, Jeff. But, well, but thanks it, for sharing. It, it, it's a great uh, couch story for the late okay. night shows. Okay. Like, where did I first read my first Jack what, Reacher book? And what, um, what what can we do? I mean, I in my day job, I I'm a lobbyist. So what can we do? And I don't know corned beef hash from hashtags but what what can we do <laughs> jeff to, to to i mean let's let's light up hollywood and yeah, make sure yeah. jeff bosley is the next jack reacher um the biggest thing and then here's the cool thing about the author is the rights have gone back to him and he's actually explicitly said i've seen it come out of his mouth to my face that he wants an unknown actor in a new face to fill the role of the giant character so that, that's unprecedented in Hollywood. They normally want a known face and a known quantity and, and all that. So he's very – he's listening to the fans, uh, literally metaphorically. So uh, his Twitter, his Facebook, his name's Lee Child. Uh, we've met twice. I've spoken to a panel with him. So we, without being pompous, he knows who I am. We've met. I'm actually meeting him again in July. Um, so there's traction, and there is uh, not corned beef hash, but hashtag <laughs> Bosley. Bosley for Reacher is a trending hashtag. There's T-shirts and hats that company made. 
and uh, it's just there's a on the, he's very, his I don't know if he has handlers, so I can't speak if he's literally the one on the other end of the computer. But I know he, his world is active on his per, on his Facebook professional page and his his Twitter page, and um, I mean. People can just go straight there and just type in hashtag Bosley for reach, and that'd probably be enough. Um, Jeff, we'll we'll do it. We yeah. we'll do what we can. We're running out of time here, yeah, sir. Yeah, but yeah. I tell you one thing: I love several times that we've talked. You you always say we rise together. So uh, whatever oh, yeah. we can do to to help make you the next Jack Reacher, as long as you don't forget about us when you're a big star. Oh, Real I'm quick, everybody out to the premiere. <laughs> there we go. Real quick, about thirty seconds. When you have yeah. your Jim Carrey moment, when that ten million dollar check can be cash. What what are you going to do with it? What are your hot buns? Is it I, ho- horses, animals, kids? Who do you want to help? Um, I'll honestly pay off my parents and my sister and her wife's debt. And then I will put it towards uh, savings. And I love dog rescues and I love horse rescues. That's the short version. That's a very short version. <laughs> you, you done good. <laughs> Folks, look at, uh, check out jeffbosley.com, B-O-S-L-E-Y.com. And, you know, if you want to help him out before he becomes Jack Reacher, he's also got a Patreon page. That's for creative content creators. It's a p a t r e o n dot com forward slash Jeff Bosley. Jeff, thanks so much for spending your time here with us today on American Warrior Radio. Oh, it's my honor, sir. Thank you for having me. It means a lot. Folks, this podcast and over 200 other interviews with heroes can be found at AmericanWarriorRadio.com. Check out our Facebook page, American Warrior Radio. Thanks again so much to Medicare Mentors for helping bring us to Colorado Springs. We look forward to spending our Sunday mornings with you good folks there as well. Until next time, folks, all policies and procedures are to remain in place. Take care. You've been listening to American Warrior Radio. You can hear over 150 episodes of this program at AmericanWarriorRadio.com.